Uh, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. How are you? Thank you for taking out the time to join us at the session of uh, Park Launch, where we will be discussing a topic very close to my heart and um, uh, focusing on mental health, the challenges and innovation that are required to make it accessible to everybody, which I think is the need of the day, if not the hour. Um, we're joined today by Danish Munir, um, and I'm happy to host this session with him. Danish is the founding partner of Grey Matter. Um, it's a VC firm dedicated to advancing innovation in mental, behavioral, and brain health. Prior to Grey Matter, Danish founded Genoa Telepsychiatry, mm -hmm. formerly One Doc Way, one of the first telepsychiatry companies in the country, um, in the US. After growing Genoa to become the largest telepsychiatry company in the country, serving 250K patients, visits per year in 35 states. Genoa was acquired by Optum in 2018. And after seeing the evolution of digital mental health at Optum, Danish decided to dedicate his next act in mental health to taking a systems level approach and improving the entrepreneurial journey for the next generation of founders. Danish is also a founder at Watershed Ventures, a venture capital firm that harnesses the power of entrepreneurs from non-traditional backgrounds to cause transformative change in industries that matter, especially including healthcare. He serves on the investment committee at Watershed and has been personally investing and advising behavioral health startups since 2011. He started his career at Microsoft, focused on business analytics and optimization and received a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, Computer Information Sciences from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and from first-hand reporting, I've heard that he's a pretty cool guy and his fund invests exclusively in mental health startups. Um, he has his own personal journey and his experiences, which we would like him to share that led him to help these companies and now has 20 plus startups in his portfolio. And uh, to quote, unquote, uh, from first-hand reporting, he's a pretty impressive guy. That's what um, the reporting has to say. Hi, Danish. Thank you for taking out the time to speak to us and um, to participate in this session of Park Launch. Thank you, Shumesha. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. I realize you have an incredibly hectic schedule, and I know you've been on and off flights for the last few days. So thank you again, and thank you, Ali, and all the team at Park Launch for not just initiating, but, you know, coming forth with such a fantastic idea. So, Danish, we're going to jump right in for the audience that is with us. We're going to divide this into two segments. The first 30 minutes is going to be a, a sort of a conversation with Danish about how he came up with the idea, the purpose behind it, um, how he scaled it, what the exit was, what he's focusing on now. And the next, the last 20 minutes are going to be focused on your questions and answers that is very specific to uh, the information that you would like in order to replicate or to get inspired um, by what Danish has to say. So Danish, let's jump right in. Everything starts off with an idea. <clears throat> and um, you clearly had a very successful career. And in terms of the startup space, with your background, you could have gone into anything. Why this particular sector? Absolutely. First of all, um, Shumesha, thank you for having me here. I want to you know, thank um, Ali for, for inviting me for this. I've heard about Park Launch for so long. So many of my friends have been part of this community for so many years. And um, I've seen the evolution of both the Pakistan tech ecosystem in Pakistan and then, then the diaspora that has been so excited to be involved, support, learn about it and, and see innovation happen in Pakistan. And I know we've had cycles uh, come and go. And so to be here uh, with you all, um, with this community, is a is a you know it's a treat for me and uh, and like you said it's a bit of a hectic uh, you know week or so I'm actually here in Chicago I was here for a wedding uh, so it's it's great to be able to jump on and uh, meet everybody here um, maybe it would be helpful if I just give a little bit of quick background on on how I got to the mental health space I had no formal training or experience in the space to be perfectly honest I grew up in Karachi. Uh, like a lot of people um, who came here for the first time, I you know didn't know a lot about a lot about the different industries here and the different professional opportunities available here. Um, my childhood was one where I was really surrounded by people who were in business 
everybody in my family, from my father to my uncles, they were all small business entrepreneurs trying to establish themselves, trying to fight all the good fights that come with uh, having your own business uh, and stand on your own two feet. Um, my, da my dad was making leather for Italian shoe companies. I had an uncle, my chacha, who was, uh, he was making rice, uh, you know, producing rice and milling rice in Pakistan for East African countries. I had an uncle who was making carpets for Germany and all small businesses, right? Like nothing crazy. Um, but I was really interested in technology from a very young age. Uh, when I was eight or nine, I started programming. And I, you know, at that time, this is before the internet uh, in the early 90s. And so we used to get these magazines that my uncles would bring when they were traveling. And on these magazines, I learned about Bill Gates and I learned about um, his vision for one computer on every desk. And as a young person, that was really inspiring for me. Um, the idea that, you know, uh, we could increase human productivity by giving people better tools and like how Steve Jobs said, like, you know, a bicycle for the mind uh, that allows you to go further. To me, that was really inspiring. It felt like that was the kind of thing I could get countries like ours out of the situations that we're in. Uh, and so uh, I, I was lucky to be able to come here to the U.S. to study, combine both those interests. I studied engineering and finance uh, in, my, in my undergraduate uh, at, at Wharton. And um, like a lot of people who go to Wharton, I got sucked into Wall Street briefly. Uh, I didn't know, you know, as a young person, didn't know what I was doing with my career. Uh, and that's what all the smart kids seem to be doing. So I, so I went there. Um, and very quickly, I found out that, you know, while it was a very rewarding career in many ways, it was not what I wanted to do. Uh, I was I happened to be at Lehman Brothers summer of 2008, which for those who follow uh, the U.S. financial markets was, you know, the epicenter of the last financial crisis um, and, and went bust that summer. That was their last summer around. So to be there at the center of it all and to see it was really interesting time, opened up my eyes to that industry. And I decided that, you know, at that time it was not for me. I wanted to go build things. And so I went to Microsoft and I built my initial like tech jobs there. I was, you know, doing work in um, online safety. I was using data science and machine learning to solve problems in phishing and malware and spam and pornography, any kind of content filtering at scale. And, uh, it was through that work. Uh, this is right when um, the iPhone was brand new and uh, it was just starting to reach young people and uh, Facebook had just reached high school that, you know, I had access to these traffic dashboards and, and data and I could see where people were spending their time and how that was shifting as a result of these brand new technologies in ways that had never been seen before. And, you know, uh, it, it, growing up in Karachi, uh, you know, with a very sort of middle class traditional family background, you know, we were so used to our parents having so much visibility and insight into where we're spending our time, what content we're consuming. You know, ghar pe sab TV bhi sabka control hota tha ki aap kaun se channels dekh rahe hain, kis wakt TV dekh rahe hain. Agar aap high school mein kisi se phone pe baat kar rahe hain, to aapki ammi jo hai dusre kamre se phone utha ke check kar lengi ki kaun hai, zyada ladkiyon se to baat nahi kar rahe, right? Like those kinds of experiences where we all sort of grew up with this idea that as much as we fought it, you know, our parents did influence and shape to a large degree, uh, at least in our formative years, right? Like it's important in your formative years for, for that, for that um, visibility um, because the, the human mind is not ready. It's very elastic and very plastic. And so to expose it to things before it's sort of settled, you know, you, you can't control what's going to happen always. Um, and so uh, to see that young people were going to have access to these things earlier and earlier in life before they're fully developmentally ready for them, it was always interesting to me. Like this is 09, 10, 11, right? As early as that. And then there was a few. It's actually the demise of the BlackBerry and the beginning of the iPhone. And I remember, I mean, for those of the, the I don't know about the audience, but I'm old enough to remember the first, uh, I think it was um, right around the time you know, the BlackBerry was sort of dying by 2011, 2012, if you recall, and then the iPhone was taking over and nobody knew what that entailed. I'm guessing you did because you had the, the access to the dashboard. So you're monitoring the activity and the flow that was going on. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. That's exactly right. And, you know, again, very hard. It's much easier to explain these things looking backwards. It's much harder to predict what's what new changes in society today are what consequences they'll have going forward, right? Like we're we're seeing things like v, v, uh, virtual reality and AI now take a hold and this is sort of the beginning of those things. And we'll only know 10, 15 years from now truly how they change society. But, you know, you also, also have some intuitions. You can tell like there's certain things that will change society. 
and uh, you can sometimes even predict the direction and you hope that there'll be some balance, right? That there'll be some positives and some trade-offs that you can manage. So this is what was the environment at the time. And then there was some, you know, incidents happening in my family growing up again in Pakistan uh, in the 80s, 90s. You know, mental health was not something that you talked about. It was um, the stigma around it, the taboo nature of it, both mental illnesses, conditions like schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, mood disorders, but also just general mental wellness and health, right? Like having a uh, a state of mind that is at peace, that is at calm, that is like uh, self-aware, all of these things, uh, emotion, emotional regulation, right? Uh, learning how to manage your anger, learning how to manage your gratitude. These are all things that did not grow up with those in our vocabulary, right? Um, and so I was completely unaware of those things, despite having gone to, to college here in the U.S., because at that time, even in the U.S., these were not things that you talked about in college. Um, it's not only now, today, like that in college, these have become almost essential to talk about. Um, but there was, like, as I peel back the layers, uh, there were always these stories of, like, some grandparent or some uncle whose behavior was always explained as just erratic. Right? And, like, as I started, like, peeling that stuff back, it became clear to me, like, oh, okay, that specific member of the family that everyone's talking about and is slightly scared off, they actually have bipolar disorder, right? They have type 2 bipolar disorder that has been undiagnosed and that needs treatment. Or, you know, somebody, right? Which, again, not to take away from all of, I mean, I believe uh, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual person, I'm a religious person, I believe in, you know, the divinity and, and, and sort of... Um, you know, our, our Quran tells us about the existence of jinn. So I'm not in any... And so what also is yeah. you believe the unseen. And so, yes, I, I, I completely yeah. understand. Yeah. So I believe in all of that. And yet, at the same time, you know, hearing about somebody who's occasionally seeing things or is hallucinating, right, in in real life, not just about jinns, but about other things as well, um, you know, that is schizophrenia. And again, undiagnosed, right, for a lot of people. Uh, and then, you know, depression, forget about it, right? That's just... We take it, you know, uh, our society is used to having a tough life. Economic circumstances are tough. Our baseline expectation for how gritty you have to be or how much you have to just toughen up and like suck it up, especially for, you know, this idea around masculinity and what it means to be a man and how that means to like never be vulnerable or allow yourself to experience certain emotions, right? There's so many things that are backed in and around uh, experiences that are related to mental health that we suppress and that we don't talk about and they were not in my vocabulary either and it was only during that time through a series of incidents in my family uh, and um, with a friend here in the US uh, whose family was in mental health um, that that became my gateway to learning about mental health industry it was like a Pakistani family Pakistani American family who'd been here for a while they came here to study they were in St. Louis and they had sort of adopted me uh, you know I would go to their home for all my holidays, my Thanksgivings, my fall breaks. And, you know, it was at their dinner table that I learned about the mental health industry. And as I was going through that journey, I realized that there's not many resources in Pakistan. There's not a lot of, you know, the shortage of providers, like the just the lack of any payment models for it. You have to pay for everything out of pocket. And this care can be very expensive if you need to be institutionalized, if you have to stay in an inpatient setting, if you have an addiction and you need a treatment center, right? Like the rich can afford it. But most people can't afford that stuff. And there's hardly any care. But it wasn't just bad there. Here in the US, actually, in 2010, things were pretty terrible too. We discovered, my friend and I, that 90 million Americans were living an hour and a half away from a psychiatrist in 2010. That's 90 million Americans in a country of 300 million people. That's almost one in three adults who have that experience, which means that if you live an hour and a half away from a psychiatrist, and psychiatric care is ongoing care. It's not a one-off. You know, you know, mental health care, as for those who are familiar with it, and we'll talk about more, it can be months or sometimes even years, right, that you're in care. Um, and so for someone to go a, a half a day round trip to get seen in the richest country in the world, 
that was just mind blowing for me. That that could How be was the first gap that you identified. Was there a particular reason that you identified this gap? Because you've talked about, you know, how you were living with this family, and then you, as you look back, even in Pakistan, yeah. you know, identify that. But I'm saying, so the idea came from um, an obstacle that you had to overcome. Perhaps a friend who was going through uh, mental health issues who really did have to commute three hours both ways to sort of get healthcare sorry to get um to the psychiatrist was that your so it, uh... it, it, for, for me it was in the in pakistan like where i discovered the problem right like i had family going through challenges with that uh, in pakistan but as i was looking there it, i became aware of the general problem not just my specific problem but i became aware that this problem is not just confined to pakistan this problem is actually global and i was living here i had a career here at that time so it, it was very hard for me to go back and Start I'm something there. To identify at what point? At, there's always a pivot point. At what point did you decide to do a deep dive into the healthcare sector and the gaps that you started identifying? Like I said, it was an incident in my family that was going on at the time, and that's what led me to start looking into this. And as I looked into it more, I saw that it wasn't just in Pakistan. This is in 2010. Uh, that it wasn't just in Pakistan, that it's also prevalent here, right? I started looking for resources here and I started talking to people here and I found that, oh, it's actually, and it was actually that friend of mine who really led the way through that because uh, he, he, his family was in that space. So they were aware of these problems and he was also thinking about these problems. So it was for me, you know, it was a combination of things. It was not one thing. It was a combination of things. And, and then, as that friend was going down this path of exploring what to do about it here, um, I was his tech friend. I was like his engineer friend, right? And so he would call me and be like, hey, what do we do about this? And is this possible or can we solve it this way? And, you know, I became a sounding board. And, you know, we, we and the third friend started this company together. Um, when you started this company, were there other such companies on the market? I'm sure you probably looked out and compared because it's very important to sort of, you know, see who your competition is, um, what they're doing, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and then make a decision about how you want to go forward with the strategy. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. So before I answer that, let me just talk about what we came up with, right? Um, the, or the path we went through figuring out like specifically what we're going to do. We, we knew that generally we identified access as one of the gaps in mental health, right? That there's an access gap. We also identified just in general in the US and healthcare that cost was a big issue. This is like in 2010, so Obamacare was getting debated in Congress and that was all the news, right? Every day the articles were about Obamacare and how the Republicans were against it and the Democrats wanted it. And the conversation was all about how healthcare costs in the US is unaffordable. And mm -hmm. So we thought like, okay, how do we make this care both affordable and accessible? And, you know, we found this thing called telemedicine and we discovered that, you know, in Canada and Australia, people were already using telemedicine, that it was a, that in psychiatry, you could get equivalent results for a visit, whether it was done in person or whether it was done in telemedicine. The first thing was establishing that, hey, this can be done in this good enough, at least in a clinical level, on an academic level, right? There was like studies and papers showing that. So then the next thing was, okay, so how do you bring that to the US? And as we started looking around, there were a couple of people who had been doing this in small settings. There were some psychiatrists who themselves had invested in some technology, like, you know, they were using these, um, at that time, there were these, there were these like, big hardware machines, like Polygom and Cisco had these mm -hmm. massive like devices that you could, they could take half a room and you would have a telemedicine setup, right? It would be a video camera, like a physical one. There would be a screen attached to it. It would come as a bundle thing. It, there was like $20,000, $30,000 cost to install that. You need to install the same system on both ends because if you didn't have that, you couldn't do it over the internet as a general uh, mechanism. And then there was a couple of like early stage startups that were also starting to come up, but we didn't see that as our competition. What we saw as a competition was that in 2010, 99.99999% of visits were done in person. So that was our competition. And then more than 50% of patients who were diagnosed with a mental condition never got any care at all. And so that was our competition, right? We didn't define competition as like, oh, is there somebody who's trying to do what we're trying to do? The competition was the state of affairs and the status quo, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that was a frame that was really valuable. 
because what that allowed us to do was as other competitors came up and there were a few that started coming up alongside us, we were not threatened by them. We actually saw them as collaborators. We saw that all of us together were trying to compete with in-person visits and we were trying to compete with the current state of people not getting any care. And so we ended up, you know, uh, we had to go and educate all of us together, our three or four competitors, we went and educated psychiatrists about why telemedicine is good enough. We went and educated legislatures, like people who make laws in cities and states and, and the federal government about why they needed to allow reimbursement for telemedicine. Because when we started, insurance wouldn't cover it. Only seven states out of the 50 would cover telemedicine. Uh, and so that was our, you know, th that frame of how we thought of competition was really mm -hmm. important. Because if we had focused on those three or four competitors and you know, I'm going to hide my things from them or be secretive. I don't think that we would have been able to be as effective. We were you learning on education, changing policy and regulation. That was your primary thing to get this um, yes. to people, but to make it affordable for people. And that required the insurance companies, uh, the policymakers. So across Absolutely. dozens of states. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And you, so keep, keep going. So, how long did it take you? What was the onboarding process? How did you manage all three things? Yeah, and, and so, you know, initially, again, we had to build all the technology ourselves. You know, things like Zoom didn't exist. In mm -hmm. mental health, uh, EHRs or electronic health record systems didn't exist. Uh, mental health was left out of the Parity Act, which in the US gave all these hospitals and healthcare clinics money to adopt software and, and technology. Um, in the early 2010s, mental health was left out of that. It was a stepchild of healthcare. So there was no tools, there was no software. So we had to build everything from scratch. And we were a very lean team. No VCs wanted to fund the space because of the stigma and just the general lack of awareness. And VCs, we would go to these VC meetings and they would ask us questions like, hey, if a patient commits suicide, will your startup shut down? Like, how will you handle that, right? And in mental health, that's a real risk. So they were not wrong but they but they were thinking about it the wrong way no one opens no one's opening a psychiatric clinic thinks it that way They're saying hey if a patient commits suicide will my clinic shut down right, right. Like that's a risk and you get malpractice insurance and you know i mean these are real real things to think about but these are not reasons to not fund a company um and so it took us three years of bootstrapping and we became really good at applying to and winning venture prize competitions that gave us small amounts of money uh to survive um, before we actually raised the venture capital. And then very quickly, we started scaling. Uh, we grew our teams. We built teams uh, onshore and offshore. We built our engineering teams in Pakistan. Uh, we had some small teams in India, in Nigeria. And ultimately, we had our largest engineering team in Mexico and in New York. Um, and I was building those teams. And then on the business side, we had all our teams in the US. Uh, so we were doing you know, remote work, both on the clinical side and on the engineering side as early as 2010, 2011, um, well before the pandemic. And then, you know, it's uh, it's sort of scale over time. We got acquired by a private equity-backed company, and I'll fast forward a little bit. And by 2018, we became the largest telepsychiatry company uh, in the country. The company that acquired us in 2015 was a pharmacy business. They were building pharmacies for mental health patients that were located at the same points of care where we were building telemedicine rooms. So our care model wasn't a patient doing the visit from home because some of these were very complex patients. Some of our patients who had serious mental illness, who had schizophrenia, who had bipolar, they didn't even have stable housing. Sometimes they would you know, be in different housing month to month, or sometimes they wouldn't have housing. Um, and they could be you know, unstable, crashing on someone's couch or on the streets even sometimes. Um, but what we would do is we would build these telemedicine rooms or kiosks in their vicinity and the patient would come to that clinic in their vicinity that was close to them and they would see our providers, our, our clinicians who were an hour and a half, two hours away, and that's how they would get seen. And by 2018, um, and, and this, ph this pharmacy company that acquired us was building their pharmacies at those same locations we were building those clinics. So it was a really nice convenience. The patient could walk out of the telemedicine visit and go right next door and get the meds filled right there which, you know, in, I think in Pakistan is actually ahead in this way. Like most clinics, you know, there's a pharmacy close by. In the U.S., it's actually not the case. In the U.S., actually people have to drive somewhere else to get to a pharmacy. And the adherence rate for patients, patients with serious mental illness was about 40, 45%, which means that half the patients 
who were diagnosed with a mental health condition and were even getting a prescription for a mental health drug were not actually picking up their meds because some obstacle got in the way, whether it was like they forgot about it, whether they got sick, whether they couldn't afford it, right? Half the patients weren't even staying on their meds, so how will they get better? And by building these pharmacies on site, we were solving that problem as well. So ultimately in 2018, we, uh, we were acquired by collectively, that whole business was acquired by United Health which is the largest health insurance company in the US. They have uh, over 40 million lives that they cover in mental health um, that they're responsible for. And we uh, we became part of United Health. Okay, so um, I think uh, before we move on to the other questions that uh, people have, so that's the history of what you did. Um, I think if I'm not incorrect, the reason why you were able to do this successfully was because you didn't just focus on the profitability, you focused on the purpose, correct? I mean, I think we had to, um, the reason for starting the business was focused on profitability. You wouldn't have gone through the hustle for the first three years and like bootstrapped yourself. Long. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, you know, anytime you commit to doing something, you have to see it through. And, you know, I think that were there other far more lucrative things to do perhaps? Absolutely. Right. Like there was like, you know, I was leaving when I left Microsoft to start this company, Microsoft had just applied for my green card. So by leaving, I knew that I was walking away from a green card and, the, and, and that this was a startup, this could die and that my green card wasn't going to be in jeopardy forever that I, you know, and I, visas are very complicated here. And that happened. I, I delayed my green card by seven, eight, nine years, I think after that. Uh, before I could get one and the entire time there's a couple of times where I almost had to like get kicked out of the country because the visas were expiring or something was going on um, so there was always risks involved but we were committed to it the profitability was important because I, I believe that for impactful businesses to, to actually achieve their potential to have the impact they can have they have to be profitable right like, otherwise you're running a charity otherwise you're depending on someone to philanthropically support you and uh if you don't have a business model that can scale. So it was important for us to find a business model that scale, and we did. Uh, that's what allowed us to serve that many patients because without that reimbursement, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't rely on doctors to donate their time. We couldn't rely on, you know, these clinics who were hosting us to do it for free. Um, so we had to have incentives for all of them. And that was only possible by creating a business model that was profitable. It just took longer and harder to find that business model in a space that was complicated, that was neglected, and where, frankly, a lot of the previous care was provided by nonprofits. A lot of the care in mental health prior to that time was provided by nonprofits. So for a really large private company to come think about scaling it meant that it required overcoming a lot of obstacles. So it was a process of trial and error. It was like you did have direction, you did have a roadmap, but a lot of it was yeah. sort of, you know, let's let's tweak this here, let's, let's pull back here, let's try to do... Yeah. You were working real time to get this done. Okay, so um, the first question that the audience has, um, and I'm going to ask this question and come back to a question that you know I'd like to loop in is, they want to know how do you reduce the stigma around mental health? I realize there's a lot more stigma in Pakistan than there is in the US, yeah. and especially um, post pandemic, you know, we realize that the stigma has reduced significantly, at least here in uh, the US. And um, interestingly enough, as much time as I believe that the younger generation does spend on their phones, which is going to cause or is causing a lot of other issues. They also do have the language, I believe, that um, at least we didn't have. Um, they have the language about how they feel, how they know how to express themselves um, quite eloquently, I feel. So coming around stigma, to what extent do you think there's still a stigma around mental health here in the United States? And then we can move to Pakistan. I think there's still stigma. I think we've become comfortable, you know, 10 years ago, if you worked in an industry like finance or consulting or banking or something like that, you would never at work talk about saying, oh, I think I'm experiencing depression or, oh, I think my anxiety is getting in the way of me being able to focus at work or, oh, I'm having issues with like regulating my emotions. I, my anger is getting the best of me. It's, it's affecting my relationships, right? Like those are things you could never say 10 years ago. And now in the workplace, you can. Right. You can talk about, hey, I'm going to therapy, I'm going to couples therapy, my relationship with my partner, or my spouse is affected. You can talk about these things now. But still in the US, there is still stigma around addiction and getting treatment for addiction. Right. We 
uh, you, you know, if you have a problem with alcoholism or if you have a problem with, you know, marijuana or if you have a problem with like other hard drugs, that's and you're trying to get help for it, you're trying to give it up. And we know how hard it is to give up these these things. You need treatment, right? You need behavioral treatment um, combined with medication to help you in some cases. Um, and, and that's very hard to talk about. It's also, there's also a lot of stigma still with schizophrenia and bipolar, right? Uh, other serious mental illnesses where it's kind of hard. Like, you know, you, you don't talk about openly at work and saying, hey, I think I'm having like manic episodes, right? Um, that's still, there's still a stigma with those types of things. In your relationships, like, you know, you are entering a new relationship, you're starting to date someone or you're looking to get engaged to someone. You know, when do you bring that up? How do you share that? Like, you know, it's there's still a certain heaviness to that. And so we need more work around educating people on how, you know, people with these conditions can still live very normal, productive lives. Some of the most talented people, some of the most productive people in society have been uh, people who've had these conditions that have managed them. And by the way, someone doesn't need to be productive to justify them having self-worth, right? You don't have right. to... You like prove that oh somebody won a prize somewhere so that's why bipolar is okay right because that bipolar person was a nobel prize winner you, every person is worth uh every life is wor worthy and we we need to see it that way um but in pakistan things are unfortunately still much worse i think you know stigma is extremely prevalent and there's a very very small portion of the population that is digitally connected that is starting to uh get comfortable with these things but people don't want to talk about like you know uh their kids uh going through mental health conditions people don't want to talk about hey my child attempted suicide you know we see it through a lens of like taboo and purely from religion which is again very important right again like, i want to emphasize i am a religious person i'm not a secular person so i see that intersection but we cannot help people live good lives if we put barriers in the way of them you know, right? So why do we put that barrier in front of that? And the only way we overcome this, I think I have a lot of hope with the younger generation. I think they're going to lead the way and they will, they're going to be the ones who help us fight this stigma. But it's going to have to come from everywhere. It's going to have to come from corporates funding campaigns and acknowledging that a lot of workplace habits are contributing to bad mental health, um, workaholicism, hierarchy at work, you know, not unmanaged hierarchy at work. These are all things that contribute to stress and anxiety and poor mental health. I think our government has a huge role to play. I think in schools, right, there's a huge opportunity to introduce social and emotional learning emotional regulation very early so young people have a better toolbox so that they when they live through life and they when they come across these challenges that they have a better toolbox to deal with them they can manage their own anxiety and, and, and mild depression through cognitive behavioral therapy and other tools that can be self-taught you don't always need a psychiatrist or a psychologist for everything but you know you we also need to invest in more people going into those fields so there's a lot of work to be done and um and i think there are some good people who are doing that work. Okay, so in terms of the startups that you are investing in, anything exciting, anything that's particularly um, uh, important to you that you'd like to share where you really believe that innovation is happening in the in the, in the the yeah. healthcare in the mental, um, you know, uh, space? Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a few, uh, maybe I'll touch on two or three areas. We talk about this for a much longer time. You know, I think the first thing is that in the mental health industry, one of our fundamental challenges is that how we define a condition, right, is very different from how we define most medical conditions. For most medical conditions, we can look to the physiology, to the biology, to physical biomarkers of the progression of that condition. Aqua diabetes, we can track your, you know, H1C, you know, we can, you, you're, you have like sugar, we can track that, you know, we can do blood tests. Uh, you have a fracture, we can measure the length of that fracture to an x-ray or an MRI and diagnose and say, okay, this is a hairline fracture. This is this type of fracture. Here's the treatment for this. And so based on that, we now have standards and protocols for care that are homogenized, that are standardized everywhere. And we can say someone is getting good care based on give, their given condition and the given protocol that was followed. We can say this was good care or not good care, right? So we have a lot of objectivity 
right. medical care for surgical procedures, for a prescription of medicine. We can say, hey, this medicine is a good protocol for this condition. This medicine is off protocol, right? In mental health, we still don't have those underlying biomarkers. We still don't have those underlying physiological a connection between the diagnoses today that's in an easy accessible way and the actual conditions. So what we rely on are, on are self-reported symptoms. There's these two tools, and I'll go into a little bit of detail here, but this is, like, for example, the PHQ-9. It's a nine-question survey that patients have to fill out, which asks questions in the format of, have you in the last two weeks experienced X, Y, Z, and how often? You know, a little bit, a lot, too much. And the answers of those questions are what determine today whether you have a diagnosis or not and what kind of diagnosis do you have. There are some, for some other conditions like schizophrenia and bipolar, there are certain observed behaviors that you can, again, ask third parties to objectively record. But generally, it's a very like reporting-based diagnostic infrastructure, which is very limiting because your self-reporting can be very subjective. And it can change from day to day. If I fill the survey out in the morning when I have had a lot of rest and I woke up fresh, I might have different answers. By the afternoon, my anxiety has come back or my depression, you know, I'm, I'm in it right now, I'm feeling it. You know, I might report differently, right? I had a positive interaction with someone, I might report differently. I had a negative interaction with someone, it might exacerbate my anger or whatever. So there's a lot of variability in the measurement. There's a lot of the conditions that are defined are not as they don't, their boundaries are not as objective. Oftentimes, a lot of these conditions are overlapping. Sure. Somebody who has bipolar will also have depression, may also at some point in their life experience an addiction because they didn't get help and they fell into an addiction, right? Like that was right. the only coping mechanism they had. So because there's like not, like there's, it's all fuzzy, then the treatment protocols are also fuzzy in that we don't have objective today clearly delineated pathways that are at least practiced. There is evidence-based medicine. Now, don't, I'm not saying that there aren't actual treatment protocols that are there, but how they're practiced, there isn't enough data about them that is captured. So most people who go into therapy, we don't always know if they're getting an evidence-based treatment or if they're just staying in therapy forever and just talking to this therapist who sits with them once a week on a couch and just hears them out and you know, isn't they aren't actually getting better, right? So there's been no data. So a lot of the startups we're investing in first today, I say all of that to say our first wave of innovation, the first set of companies that we're investing in are all focused on saying, how do we measure people's progress? How do we make sure that after every, after and before every session, we're tracking their progress and driving objectivity? And how do we make sure that the providers are using evidence-based care, not just whatever they want to, right? Freudian care or whatever else. And so that's like, you know, in every condition area, we funded companies like doing that. One example is a company called Nima Health, and they are focused on PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which happens to you after you've had some life episode or encounter where you experience a lot of trauma for a sustained period of time, or even for a short period of time, it can be just high enough trauma that, that you have uh, these, these disorders. And so this company uses a combination of psychiatric care, i.e. medication management, and therapy and counseling, and they combine it in a, in a way where the different providers providing those different parts of care are coordinating with each other. So it's not, okay, you're going to two different providers and they don't talk to each other and you're the one managing, so they know what's going on and the care is actually like working with effectively together. And it's all bringing it under insurance, which is really hard. A lot of mental health care is actually not covered by insurance in the US in the past. And so they're getting this all under insurance at, you don't have to pay for it out of pocket. So that's you know one example of the kind of company. Or a company that is, let's say, called SoulSide, which is doing group therapy. And group therapy can be very effective, in a, especially in, a, in an environment where you don't have enough therapists, one-on-one -on -one therapy for everybody. Groups can be a way of unblocking the system, right? It creates more capacity because in a group, you can have six or eight or 10 people together. But groups are really hard for providers, for the clinicians themselves, because they have to keep track of every patient's progression, right, across session from session, which can be a lot of mental overload. And they have to document every session for every patient separately. So this company called SoulSide is building an AI co-pilot for group therapy. And what this co-pilot does is that it sits and listens in onto the session and it auto documents every single patient's history and current session. And it's also giving the provider of their screen some cues on where to take the conversation next, 
right, using large language models. So it's a super innovative company. So I give those two examples because there's one company that isn't, technology is part of it, like the NEMA company, where they're using telemedicine. So there's certainly some technology, but the innovation is on the business model side Right. And the clinical side, and they're using really robust measurement to track how your PTSD is progressing. And this company, in eight weeks or 12 weeks, they can get two thirds of their patients in remission. Like okay. two thirds of the patient who otherwise would have had lifelong PTSD are in remission after eight to 12 sessions, which is incredible. And then they have this company that's using technology and really. How long are you tracking their progress for? How long has it been since they go into remission and then you follow them, I'm guessing, for a certain period of time, at yeah. least? You know. Yeah, yeah. They they stay in maintenance. They stay in maintenance mode. They stay with the patients for you know up to a year, or maybe even more sometimes in maintenance mode. So the first eight to twelve weeks for Nima might be very intensive treatment. They might have like a few sessions a week, some with a psychiatrist, some with the with the, with the therapist, some with the peer coach. Um, but uh, and then after that, they'll stay with the patient once a month for for a period of time, or it might step down. Right, the care might step down. Um, so we have data now for over two years of worth of patients and the data is pretty consistent and really good. And but, my question with the AI was going to be that, um, how do you program it? Because I mean, you're, you're doing these group, um, you're integrating into groups within here in the U S. So I'm guessing that there is no one particular sort of, um, ethnicity or whatever that's within those groups. So your, um, your AI has to be able to pick up on these little like cues, nuances, um, you know, sort of read. So the programming is, is incredibly important, like what's going into making that AI model and then the recommendations they're giving. How are you putting in those those sort of, how do I put it? Um, Cultural sensitivities or, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, it's like saying like, you know, uh, you know, if, if there's some Pakistani uh, uh, guests in the, in, the, in the audience, you know, if you had like a, Everybody grows up with different cultural traditions, right? You're Punjabi, you're Balochi, you're Pratan, you're, you're Urdu speaking. You have certain norms, right? Like there's a certain baseline of behavior that is like different, right? right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to apologize and I'm going to use some stereotypes just to make this clear. And I really, really apologize for using these stereotypes. But I'm Punjabi, so let's say like Punjabis are loud, right? And so the baseline level of like what is normal, right? In terms of emotional expressiveness or getting angry or getting excited might be different than for a different... Uh, demographic in Pakistan, even, right? Punjabi, so I want to attest to that. Absolutely. My father's side is Urdu speaking and my Anani was Pratan. So Punjabis definitely have a higher level of enthusiasm, anger. Sure. And, yeah. and, then, and I can yeah. say this because my mother is Punjabi. So it's a very cool thing too. But... <laughs> and I want to be careful of not feeling stereotypes also, right? Because I mean, everybody's different and everybody's unique. But at the same time, I'm just using this just to illustrate a point where, you know, for an AI to say, oh, this person in the session was vocal, or, or let's just take introversion and extroversion. Some people are more introverted and some people are not, right? So even in a group therapy session, for the AI to figure out that a specific patient, the, the same amount of participation in the conversation by two people might mean different things. One person is just chat, chattier, and so they're participating in the conversation to a certain level might not mean anything. For another person who's very quiet, for them to be participating that much means they're actually opening up right? That's actually a healthy sign. And so these models that this company is building have to incorporate for all of this. And it's very hard. And this company is relatively early. But what we are, what they do is they baseline on a per patient level, and then they track that patient's progression from session to session. And then they baseline over demographics across, you know, other patients of that demographic and cohort. And, and and some of this they're going to do in the future because they just don't have enough data yet, but they're building up that data over time. But, you know, at the end of the day, what they're starting out is they're mostly providing administrative support to the provider. They're not providing clinical judgment yet. They are providing with, you know, documentation, right? So instead of the provider having to remember what every eight, all eight patients said, they're neatly capturing the notes for all eight patients and creating a file and and then creating a summary of that so the doctor can very quickly access that summary during the session and remember oh yeah you know bob this happened to bob two sessions ago and he's talking about this thing again and i remember last time he talked about it there was an emotional trigger for his father passing away and now that someone else is talking about their father going through something else bob is going to be sensitive to that right so it's helping with those kinds of things right now it's not coming in with a clinical diagnosis yet and it doesn't need to right it's it's sort of the provider is making the clinical judgment in this case okay so now i'm going to i'm going to sort of speed up the questions because we have 15 yeah. minutes to go and um there's a there's a ton of questions and we're going to try to keep the answers concise yeah. so 
able to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so are there any any educational programs for kids and adults around mental health? Should it be taught at an early stage? You, I think you've answered this, that yes, it should be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> why aren't there many employers supporting mental health? I think in the U.S. there's a massive push. A lot of employers, I mean, in, during the pandemic, mental health became this sort of like necessity and it, the budget sort of expanded for it because, you know, people were locked up at home. There was a lot of like remote work and mandatory staying at home, which, you know, people lost their social connections at work and were very uh, isolated and lonely and loneliness feeds into well, remember, addiction rates went up, alcoholism uh, rates went up, um, yeah. people were getting... Uh, you know, divorced in Pakistan. I remember the statistic that more people filed for Khula and Sindh. Then it was just, so things exactly. happened. Yeah, exactly. It was a tough time. It, it, it's so, it, it was so recent, but yet it feel, feels like we've forgotten it because, you know, things have gotten somewhat back to normal. Uh, I, I think that, you know, during that time in the U.S. particularly, it became like almost a necessity where employees uh, were, would, when they were applying for a job, they would look at the mental health benefits a company provides as part of the insurance package, as part of the overall health benefits, because in the US, healthcare is provided through employers. Right. That's an important thing to highlight is that this is different in every country. In the, in other countries, in some countries, healthcare is provided by the government for everybody, right? And it's a different system. In the US, for most people, your healthcare is provided through your employer and different employers compete by providing different levels of benefits that they can afford. So if you're at a Google, they have very big budgets because they are a SaaS business, very profitable. Um, sorry, they're an ad business, not a SaaS business, but like a very high margin business, and very profitable. So they can provide really good benefits. You know, uh, a small local trucking company that has a services business model, mediocre margins, cannot invest as much in benefits. And so they provide more limited benefits. So it became like a point of contention and a point of differentiation where employers were fighting to provide the best mental health benefits so that they can attract the best employees. And that's what enabled a lot of these startups to come up is they, they were there was an opportunity to go to employers and say, hey, the traditional mental health benefits you get from the insurance company, they're not good enough. We have something better. And that's why the last five years, the amount of capital that went into mental health rushed. Like, you know, we had prior to 2018, we had, you know, a few hundred million total lifetime in the history of mental health venture capital that had gone in. In the last five years, we've had 11 billion of venture capital going to mental health. Mm -hmm. Five years ago or seven years ago, there were zero unicorns, billion dollar companies in mental health. Today, there's over a dozen, right? Almost 15, I think, that are mental health unicorns, right? So all of that is to say that the employer spend in this category and the increased government spend in this category in the US has been a big driving factor and contributing factor. And that's not happened in Pakistan because in Pakistan, most people don't get their health care through work. They pay for it out of pocket through themselves. And insurance is not really a big concept in Pakistan. Okay. Um, what are some of the startups focused on mental health working in Pakistan? Do you know of any? Yeah, there's a there's a number of them that have, you know, I haven't seen anything that's quite taken off and become really scale. There's some promising ones. I've seen more uh, um, where I have been excited to see is like there's some more, they, they, I, would, I would not describe them as tech startups, but there mm -hmm. are like certain evidence-based clinics that have popped up. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm aware of some in Karachi. I know there are some in Islamabad and Lahore and other places as well. But I think that's like one thing that's been exciting to me is to see that type of like uh, physical presence come up. I know our biggest shortage is providers. We don't have enough providers in Pakistan. There's just not a lot of training programs. If you look at residencies and if you look at people who go into residencies, in Pakistan, psychiatry is like, a you know, unfortunately, the stigma is there too. People who go and take the psychiatry residency, they're looked down upon by people who go to other medicine practices. So we need to fight that stigma as well, right? Um, so we just don't have enough providers we're training. But there are a couple of startups that I've seen that are part of broader telehealth companies like, you know, Sehat Kahani and others that, you know, incorporate mental health as well, um, uh, but just not enough. Not okay. enough right do you now. only invest in North America or do you invest or intend on investing in Pakistan as well? I angel invest, so I have two funds today, uh, Gray Matter, which invests just in mental and brain health. Uh, we do mental and brain health, and that is primarily in North America. Um, we don't have a restriction. We've looked at companies in Europe. We've looked at companies in Asia, but we haven't made any investments yet because 
the, the opportunity hasn't been quite great yet. And my other fund, Watershed, invests in healthy living, which is healthcare, productivity and purpose, and sustainable systems, which are very broad themes. And again, Watershed can invest abroad, but we've mostly been investing in North America. I personally, Angel, invest a little, small amount in Pakistan, um, but it's not, you know, it's been less active, frankly, recently, because um, just because of capacity, frankly. Um, another question. What is your fund size and at what stage do you invest? We are both funds invest at the early stages. So we are seed uh, investors kind of at the at the most frequent uh, instance, but we can invest up to series B, series C. Uh, we've done investments all along that spectrum. Our uh, ticket sizes are, you know, 500K to a million. Sometimes we can go a little bit smaller just to be flexible to fit into a round. Uh, sometimes we've done more, but that's sort of the range. And the funds are uh, 25 and 30 million. Okay. How do you quantify success and return for your fund? What's been the best success so far? Um, I mean, I've been investing in some capacity for the last eight years. And, you know, I have invested in over 65, 70 companies now almost um, across that time. There's a number of successes. There's different ways of looking at success. And, you know, every investment you're underwrite is different, right? You're you're, for example, in mental health, a lot of our underwrite is how transformative they are for the industry. Like the Gray Matter exists to transform the mental health industry in the U.S. because it's a very legacy and broken industry. Uh, and so it's a very mission-oriented fund. You know, some of the most interesting investments, like Tokayatri is one of our companies that we invested in. They are in 50 states. They have uh, full-time psychiatrists that they employ, so they're not doing the gig worker model, which sometimes has like impacts on quality, right? Uh, where some of these companies treat like their clinicians, like you know Uber and Lyft, to treat their drivers, like you know the, they have four apps open and they'll go wherever the patient shows up, which isn't how clinical care, I believe, should happen. Um, so psychiatry does that in fifty states, insurance-based care. That company has grown tremendously. Like we invested two years ago. Uh, they were doing 30 million revenue run rate. They're now doing over 150 million run rate, right? So tremendous success. Um, prior to Gray Matter, I invested through Watershed and a couple of other companies in non-healthcare. Uh, uh, so we invested in Rivian, which is an electric vehicle company. That one's done well, although it had done really well. And then now it's kind of come down a little bit once after it went public and some of us are still holding the stock. Um, we invest in this company called ACV Auctions, which is a dealer-to-dealer -dealer car marketplace. And I know there's some businesses like that in Pakistan as well. Um, and, and so this is like a, where any dealer can put up a car on their lot. Uh, they can use the phone to take pictures and make a 3d sort of like, you know, scan all the scratches and things like that. And then put it up for an, like a live market, like an auction and other dealers can bid on the car. So it's not a consumer marketplace. It's a dealer to dealer marketplace. And that company's done really well. It was called ACV auctions. That was a really, it was like a 14 X for us uh, at the time when we exited, um, return and then i'm an investor in headway which is also a mental health company where i was an angel investor in the series a and that one is like also like a 10x plus at this point okay um uh what is the investment trend in the mental health space what is the market size i think when they ask that question they're talking about north america specifically yeah in north america the current spend in the industry on an annual basis so there's a couple of things one 50 of patients who are diagnosed are still not getting care so there's just the current spend is not reflective of the true market size. It's just reflective of the care that's being provided today. There's like a full 50% remaining on top, right? And and by the way, many people are never even getting a diagnosis because of the stigma or just lack of access to even get to the first visit to get a diagnosis. So with all of those realities, the current spend is $400 billion a year in outpatient or inpatient spend. So it's a massive, massive, massive industry. There are over there are approximately a million professionals in the industry. And one way to think about how much innovation has happened is that if you took all the unicorns in the space and you think about how many providers they employ, that's still less than 10% of the providers in the industry. So there's still so much room to go on that. And then the trend is, you know, the first wave is around aggregation and consolidation of provider supply and using technology to measure and book and pay for care. But then the next set of innovations are around what happens inside the session. Like what is the actual care itself and how do we use science and technology to improve that? So we are looking at companies that are building devices and wearables and new pharmaceuticals and, uh, you know, use of ketamine and psychedelics and uh, neuro, neurotech, brain computer interfaces, right? So the last hundred years was about innovation and physical health. 
where we've tripled our lifespan as a society, we've fought HIV, we've fought cancer, we're fighting cancer, we're making progress, we've fought infectious disease. The next 50 years will be about mental and brain health as we develop better techniques to scan and map what's happening in the mind, the body, and human consciousness, right? Today, these are three systems that are treated independently. The mind, you have psychologists and some psychiatrists. You know, the brain, you have like neurologists, right? And human consciousness, you know, is in the realm of religion today or like yoga or spirituality or whatever else, right? And there's the interplay between this is starting to like, we're starting to understand that these things actually like work together, but how to map them and how to explain the connections is still very early in that journey. Another As session. For me, at least, like the connectivity between the three, especially human consciousness, like how do you measure that? How do you, you know, yeah. that, that, that uh, word out, Ali, that's another session. Um, totally. Going to the next uh, question. <clears throat> they say, we have a huge problem of access to mental health globally and in Pakistan. Uh, for, te for 10 million population, we have only two psychiatrists, therapists, and the prevalence is 72%. How do you think this supply and demand uh, gap can be covered along with stigma issues? Wow, I think that in itself is another session, but go for it. Yeah, you know, I think, I mean, this is a public health problem. Like, you know, the reality is that startups can play some role in this, but there's a, before this wave of mental health innovation and this capital <clears throat> happened in the US, for 25 years, there were advocates who were constantly lobbying and, and pushing society and government, most importantly, to expand funding in mental health. The Mental Health Parity Act, which was passed in 2006 under President Bush, uh, co-authored by Congressperson Patrick Kennedy, who's one of our advisors to our fund, you know, that act said that, hey, insurance companies, you can't treat mental health separately from physical health. Any benefit you provide on physical health, you have to provide the same benefit on mental health. You have to have parity. And by the way, that parity was not enforced well. So in 2018, there was a second act in Congress passed that improved that requirements on parity. So, and then the stigma, fight and stigma. So those are the precursor, sort of like the, the terrain that needs to exist for then the industry to step up and provide innovation, right? And we have a public health problem. You know, we need to fund residency programs. We need to create like pathways for reimbursement. We need to have better coverage. There's all these things that need to happen that are in the public health sphere before we can like expect the industry to really pick up. I think people will do that for the private sector, for the high end affluent sector. I think there's innovation possible and it's happening, but those are small markets. For there to be venture scale innovation, you need to serve the full market and to serve the full market, you need public health infrastructure. Okay, got it. But I do think that if um, if you're talking about just the the sort of the the five percent or whatever these big corporations, if they actually start talking about the fact that they are invested and they do care about uh, right. the well being of their employees for no other reason than other than the fact that at least it'll improve their productivity. I'm just talking about from a corporate point of view. That in okay. itself would be something to start off with. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and that's and whether that's happening, and I think that's a really important part. And you know, if if I think about what was the tipping point in the U.S., it wasn't even the laws. The tipping point was in 2015, 2016, 2017, there was a number of very visible public suicides of celebrities, like Robin Williams, you know, took his own life. And, and that's really where, like, it became part of the public dialogue, where these people that everyone looked up to and thought they were had happy, successful lives, and behind that, they were struggling with mental illness for a really long time that was not talked about. That's where it came into the limelight. So, and, and then corporate started talking about it. So I think corporates in Pakistan have a huge role to play. And I think celebrities have a huge role to play and media and arts has a huge role to play in normalizing this. I think that would set the tone. Um, uh, okay, research has shown that the therapeutic relationship is the most important factor in client, pro in client progress, regardless of psychological schools of thought or therapeutic techniques. <laughs> therapist. How will AI cover this aspect? I don't think AI will be the will be covering the practice as far as therapy is concerned. No? It might. It might in the future, you know? I, I, I mean, I mean for, I, for, as of today, yeah. as of today, no, I don't think yeah. it's... I, so I think like, to, to the person who's asking this question, I understand where you're coming from. Maybe I'll just address them specifically. I, You know, think of it this way. There are today games and activities and, in, and bots where young people talk to a fictional character for mm -hmm. hours, they have a therapeutic alliance with that character or that fictional persona or game, whatever, right? It might be. And so it's not, it's not hard to imagine how that 
that can be recreated and applied in a clinical setting. There's a lot of work to be done to prove that like the clinical effectiveness can be there. And I think there will remain skepticism. People will fight it for a long time, but the innovators will pave the way. I'm not actually worried about the therapeutic alliance. What I'm worried about more is like therapeutic dependence, right? Like where you where you become dependent on your therapist, like and boundaries actually. Like the one of the reasons why you have sessions with a certain frequency is that you don't want a patient to become dependent on their therapist. And a big part of the role of the therapist is to say, you know, that you like I'm a mirror to you. You have to go solve this problem, right? And I'm here to support you. Um and the risk with these AI based bots is that they're available to you 24 seven and they become such a crutch for you. And initially that shows results because you now have this companion all the time, but then like you become so dependent on this crutch that you actually in the future uh, can't operate without them. Like you, you, you have no independence. Asia, um, uh, Danish, that the companies that are going to come up with these products will want their clients to be with the AI bots 24 seven, because that's just how they get they to make it. So, so, you know, it's sort of, I mean, we, we will see in the years to come. I still have my... A lot of concerns. A lot of concerns. I have a lot of concerns because and, at the end still, of the day, yeah. they can't fake. They're not sentient, but they can sort of, you know, I I, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, next question. Can you ask him how a person can identify is he if he is mentally fit and healthy? Now, I don't think that he you are a therapist, but from your... Um, uh, I guess from your uh, engagement with healthcare professionals, is there any particular site that you would like to direct this person towards who said, how do you identify if a person is mentally fit and healthy? I want to be really careful here. If you are, if you, if you, if you're experiencing something that's making you question your mental health, if you're worried about like your ha happiness or your depression, if you have like ever, thought about taking your life or if you're thinking about that actively right now you should seek a professional you should get help it's really important uh you know in the u.s you can dial 988 in any any part of the country and that will connect you to a suicide hotline where you can talk to somebody i know there are some hotlines emerging in pakistan as well i'm sorry i don't have it off the top of my head um but you should talk to a professional there are you know certain like online assessments you can do if you're if you're just curious and this is more of an intellectual exercise for you you can just google like you know um online depression assessment online anxiety assessment and they'll give you those phq9 or gat7 questions i talked about but if you, if there's any chance you are you are you're thinking of like you know harming yourself like please talk to a professional talk to and talk to a loved one I'd also say that if this, whoever's asked this question, whether it is for yourself or for another person, the fact that this question has been asked means that you should definitely try to get in touch with um, a professional. Um, as yeah. soon as okay, I'm a PhD working as a research scientist on neuroscience and founded brain 90 at UC Irvine. What is the best way to speak with Danish? What's the best way for people to connect with you? LinkedIn? I, you know, it's so, uh, mashallah, the, the excitement around this topic is energizing for me. And I, and I really am pleased to hear that. And I want to support that energy. I also want to, hopefully you all will acknowledge that I have gotten already uh, dozens, if not close to a hundred requests from this podcast already. So I'm going to try my best to uh, get back to people as much as I can. LinkedIn is a good way. My ask would be, you know, instead of just saying, Hey, I want to meet with you or, Hey, can we have a meeting? Try to like describe what you're looking for as clearly as possible. Uh, my email is danish at graymattercapital.com. You can LinkedIn me, you can email me, but try to be as ex explicit as possible so I can try to get back to you. For people who just add me or who just say, let's let's talk, it's very hard for me to prioritize that. And fortunately, like, you know, there's no way I can meet hundreds of people, right? So um, try to be as descriptive as you can. As if, and if I can't meet with you, at least I can point you to somebody who would be a good resource for you for the specific type of thing you're trying to do. Um, again, same question from Malaysia and another question as well. Is it possible to ask him about any office hours to consult about expanding a proven idea with certain enhancements in the US? Repeat what you just said. Please send me an, an yeah. email. Yeah, send, send me an email. Make it as descriptive as possible. Be as clear about what you've done so far, what you're trying to do, what you need help with. And I will, the, the more clear your ask is, the more uh, likely I am to be able to help you. Danish, would you be open to sharing your email or would you prefer for people to connect with you just on LinkedIn? Email is fine. I will ask for some grace and patience. Um, 
uh, on, on responsiveness. Uh, it will take me some time to get back to you and I will try to get back to you, inshallah. Okay. Um, I think we are past the hour um, and we've tried to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Um, so last question, Danish, do you think it is possible for people to replicate this in Pakistan? And if they were to, would you be interested in helping out? Replicate what exactly, right? Um, I mean, replicate the specifically. The I built, yeah, the company that I built is not possible in Pakistan because it is very, very tied specifically to the insurance mechanisms in the U.S. And so you couldn't replicate what I did. It's just, I, I've looked into it. But, uh, you know, are there different ways of tackling mental wellness and mental health in Pakistan? Absolutely, there are. Um, I have, you know, not lived in Pakistan for a very long time, for 18 years now, right? And so... I, and I'm happy to be a supporter and cheerleader, but there are people who are actually like, you know, uh, Sarah from Sihat Kahani, you know, Dr. Sarah, she's like tremendous, right? She's actually built a healthcare company there. Um, there's a number of healthcare startups in Pakistan that are founders are actually far more intimately familiar with the reimbursement landscape, with the clinician landscape, and they're probably better resources. But again, if you if there's something I can help with that's specific and concrete, send me an ask and I will try my best. I think we have, um, yeah, Ali shared. Um, if it's uh, on this call and, here, hi. He has for he has uh, um, if it's there, a co-founder said. Okay, I think that's about it. Thank you so much, Danish, for taking out the time. Um, extremely interesting topic. I think not just for me, but for everybody. There was a ton of questions, and I think that in the limited amount of time that we had, uh, you were able to not just answer their questions. You've agreed to accept the hundreds of other emails that are going to come your way. Um, good luck you know, with that. <laughs> and you were able to take us through your entire journey from the idea to the implementation. And my gosh, seven years is a very long time to have to wait for your green card for the people who are not familiar with this in the US. It's like, a, it's like walking, it's walking, it's, 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 it's not easy. So, I mean, you must have really believed in what you were doing in order to do that. So thank you again, for taking out this time and thank you to Park Launch for, um, you know, Thank you, Shumesa, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you for guiding us through it. And then thank you, Ali, for bringing us all together as always. Take care, everybody, and have a wonderful, um, I guess the weekend is over. Have a wonderful Sunday, wherever you are. And uh, do take care of yourself and your loved ones. Likewise. Shabakhar. Assalamu alaikum.